From Fox 8 Sports, this is the Overtime Podcast. From the Fox 8 Studios in New Orleans, this is the Fox 8 Overtime Podcast. I am your host, Sean Fazan, riding shotgun as he does each and every podcast. is Andre Johnson. Junior. Do not forget the JR at the end of the name. It's very important to add the junior, no doubt about it. But before we get into today's content, be sure to like, share, rate, and review. If you are watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button to get the bell notification for when we drop that fire content. And today... We got a banger. We got a oh, good yeah. one because it's Monday, a victory Monday in the city of New Orleans. I know you are all happy <laughs> about the Saints' victory over Carolina. I know you might be a little nervous what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico right now, but just stick with us. We'll be just fine. We're going to kind of talk about what's happening here with the Saints and the Panthers and hopefully, um, well, not hopefully, uh, it was a great day. It was great vibes. We were both inside the uh, Caesar Superdome on Sunday and you kind of envision uh, how you want the game to go and how you just wanted to see the Saints get a win because we knew how important it was. And we knew how the schedule shaped up. And we knew how Carolina was. Um, but, yeah, I don't think you script that. That was, <laughs> um, that was quite impressive, regardless of how bad Carolina was a season ago. So, um, you know, that's where we have to go for the big picture here today. The Saints, no, Panthers, Saints win. They're one and zero. They're one and zero for the sixth year in a row. They don't lose season openers under Dennis Allen now. DA knows how to coach some season openers. So, Saints are one and zero. Andre, how are you? I'm doing good, Sean. We were in the dome yesterday, and man, that thing was rocking. It was at halftime. You know, I go underground to mm -hmm. set up for the post game press conference mm -hmm. and everything. And even underground, you can hear it. You can feel it. Yep. The energy in the Dome was different. Now, you've got two camps right now in the Saints fandom for the most part. You've got the camp that's so excited about mm -hmm. how the team looked and how the offense looked under Clint Kubiak because it looked better yesterday than it has in a long time, if we want to be Ooh, honest about yes. it. Then you've got the second camp who knows that it was just the Panthers. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually the Saints have to play a professional football team because whatever they played yesterday, <laughs> they were not very good. At the end of the day, both of those things can be true, and that's kind of where we do go with our big picture. Can, can Clint Kubiak, mm -hmm. with that offense that we saw yesterday, can he reshape the narrative and the stigma that's been on Derek Carr? Yeah, I, well, I, I think, first off, he was brought here to do that, to you know, find where Derek Carr can be successful and, you know, help reshape some of the things that have been surround him, surrounding him since he's been here. And, and in my opinion, if you listen to this podcast, uh, at least to me, it's been uh, unfairly around him because uh, I, I didn't think he was nearly as bad as the vitriol he received the season ago. I've said this multiple times. We all know that. Um, and I thought it was a very awkward uh, set of circumstances last year. It really was just very weird. But real quick, you talk about, yes, it is the Panthers, but look, they didn't dominate the Panthers last year, and they were arguably True. worse. Maybe they're worse this year. I don't know, but Bryce yeah, Young was a rookie last this. year, and they didn't dominate the Panthers last year, and they dominated them. They they dragged them. I mean, they they destroyed them. An opening uh, kick. I mean, from the, the, the opening whistle. So... Um, I think that's certainly important because the Panthers are bad and they're going to be bad. And, man, they just there's just no hope with that organization. But the Saints looked really, really, really good, as good as they've looked in a really long time. But back to the question at hand, the big picture question is, can Clint Kubiak change the narrative around Derek Carr? And I kind of take that one step further. Can Derek Carr, through Kubiak, win back the Houdat Nation. We have kind of talked about this in spurts here and there over the last year because last year was such a roller coaster ride, but I think he can. And I think Sunday went a long way uh, to helping him uh, win back the fan base. Some are probably inching closer. And look, I don't know what percentage falls on the ones that are in the Derek Carr camp or not in the Derek Carr camp. I know the ones that, and this is always the case, the ones that were not in his camp seem to be the loudest. Let's just yep. put it that way. Um, but, but you talk about starting the season. You talk about just, just you, you have a, you don't know the, which way something's going to go. And then you think of the best possible scenario. I think Derek Carr hit it. I mean, I think he did. The fifth player of the game was Derek Carr's most important play of his time here in New Orleans, his time here in black and gold. I don't think that's much of a stretch to say that because it's early. It's the fifth play of the game, as I mentioned. It's the first drive. You're in the Dome, which should be 
this, you know, home crowd behind you. And that's it. But there's always been this anxiety. There's always been this tension. It feels like over the last calendar year when it came to Derek Carr. And then it's third and four. They don't make the play. They don't, they throw an incompletion there. They don't get the first down. It's punting. And you, you probably wouldn't get booed. But that was always in the in the background. Yep. There were no shot at boos after that because third and four, they could have threw it to the sticks. That could have been an incompletion. But what does he do? They send Rashid Shahid on a deep post without a play action. Um, it was a very uniquely designed concept that they ran with the post over the top and the under underneath or the uh, the over out kind of on the same side instead of on the opposite side. Which is if you're a film guy, most most of the time when they run that play, it's from two different sides, not the same side. But they call the play. It's third and four. And if you watch the play develop on the right-hand side of the formation, Olave is kind of running a little inside-out jerk <clears> route <throat> and probably has enough of, a, of space to make a catch and get a first down. But Carr reads the defense. He sees the safety cheat up to take Jawan Johnson on the over route. So he knows the post route is open over the middle, deep middle of the field. He holds it for an extra count. Extra count then gets hit as he throws it, both kind of in the face and around the legs. And then when he throws it, he's kind of upright. It's not like he's in a, a very natural throwing position. He's kind of upright in the pocket. There's chaos around him. And he said, the hell with that. I'm going deep. And he yep. threw it deep to Rashid Shahid and led Rashid Shahid um, and dropped a beauty, dropped a dime to Shahid for the 59-yard touchdown. He delivered. He delivered the absolute dime, and the place was rocking. And honestly, I don't know about you, but I kind of felt like that set the tone for the entire day offensively because when you watched it, even if you despise Derek Carr, if you're in that camp, it was hard to ignore that at yeah. that moment, at that time. The first drive of the season at home against Carolina, this dude drops a dime for 59 yards for a touchdown. Whoa, I can't hate him right now. Maybe <laughs> I'll hate him later, but I can't hate him right now. And like I said before, my goodness, my goodness, did he need it? Because it it could have kind of went back and forth, and maybe they do a longer drive, or maybe they kind of go back and it maybe they don't score. But to score that way on the opening drive with a new offense and that quarterback, I just think it it totally just reversed the psyche of everyone in there. Because you, like I said before, there's always that kind of under undertone of. Do they really like this guy? Is they really are they really accepting this guy? Well, after he did that, um, even if you hated him, you couldn't really go that way. And I felt like body language wise, if you watch Derek Carr, he sprints down to talk to Rashid Shahid to celebrate whatever. His body language and his confidence was different the entire way. The entire rest of the game, his confidence was sky high. It was unlike anything we have really seen from a body language standpoint from him since he's been in New Orleans. And that's fantastic to see, obviously. He's the face of the franchise. He's quarterback one. I think of that Foster Murrow touchdown that he threw. A little bit of a risky throw. That was He went back across the middle of the field. The corner, everybody was screaming, that, run. That we were all screaming, run, run, run. And he throws it back across, you know, and it was, you know, Good body lines, good vibes, and he just goes up and Foster makes the play. But despite the DB being there to potentially make the you know the interception or a PBU, but he was risky. But he was feeling it at that point. Again, it goes back to that deep post, and he just kind of it just. I don't know if it was relief for him. I don't know if it was just just a, a just a, yes, like it happened. Yes, exactly how we drew it up. Whatever the case may be. It's like the weight of the world was lifted off of his shoulders after a very tumultuous year. And he even said it post game. There was some moments last year where it got a little dicey with the fan base. And you think back to Detroit where there was this massive oh, yeah. booing. That was, man, that, I was uncomfortable. That, that I wasn't even in the game. I was, <laughs> I was uncomfortable at that point. Um, but I just think overall that play set the tone. And I think it was a great first step to possibly this being a little bit of a redemption tour with Derek Carr and the Houdat Nation. Um, possibly because... Here's the thing. As we know, he can't do that and execute the offense that way and be that efficient and that confident and that on point to just go 180 the next game yep. or just have an average performance the next game. There's got to be some consistency because if that happens, then you're going to have some of those naysayers back. See? See, right now you've built up some good favor, um, but right now I, I think he's in a – a good spot, certainly going back uh, and, and backtracking 
uh, is not the way to go. But let's just be fair here. Carolina's not waiting for him next week. It's yeah. going to get a lot oh, tougher yeah. next week against Dallas. So back to the original question. Can Clint Kubiak help change the narrative around Derek Carr? Absolutely the strongest yes I've given on this pro, uh, on this podcast because that that's the reason you brought him in here. They want to get the most out of their quarterback. And although his stats were fine, 18 of 23 or 19 of 23, 200 yards, three touchdowns, you looked at that quarterback in the dome yesterday. You saw the look in his eye. You saw the the confidence. You saw the the joy. I, I think that's that that's the first, that's a very 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 good first step. But it's only step one. Yeah, I'm gonna say, and you've just read the stats: 19 for 23, 200 yards, three touchdowns. Despite those numbers, and of course, we can always preface it with yes, they were playing the Carolina Panthers, but you got to play who's in front of you. Mm -hmm. There was no quarterback in Week One that was better than Derek Carr. Mm -hmm. Derek Carr, you could argue very strongly, was the best quarterback this week, even if it was against Carolina. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned us being in the Dome, and, you know, they do the pregame intros. They did the offense on Sunday, mm -hmm. so all the offense runs out one by one. And when they announced Derek Carr, mostly cheers. Mm -hmm. But if you listen, there were a few underlying boos yeah. when Derek Carr got introduced. But about midway through that game, when they were playing stand up and get crunk and chop a style, and when the Saints come marching in, I promise you there wasn't a single boo mm -hmm. in that dome. Derek Carr did a lot to win over the naysayers in the fan base on Sunday. And if he continues to play that way, then I believe he can do that as the season goes on. And when you go talking about changing the narrative, the narrative that I'm thinking that may be the target for Derek Carr. I think about Kirk Cousins. Mm -hmm. When Kirk Cousins came to Atlanta this offseason from Minnesota, the vibe was, oh, man, Atlanta serious. Mm -hmm. Atlanta may go from a team that was average at best, and now Atlanta's the favorite mm -hmm. to win the NFC South. Atlanta might make some noise in the playoffs. Kirk Cousins can bring the best out of Bajan Robinson. He can bring the best out of Drake London and mm -hmm. Kyle Pitts, who have both been underwhelming at times in their young career. Kirk Cousins came to Atlanta and – it was being talked about as a franchise-changing move, not necessarily because Kirk Cousins is mm -hmm. an MVP-caliber quarterback, but he's a quarterback to where if you put the right things around him in general, people feel like Kirk Cousins can win you games. That could potentially be Derek Carr if he continues to do what he's done in this Clint Kubiak offense because we talked about it a few podcasts ago. We talked about what's at stake for Derek Carr, what's at stake for Dennis Allen. Mm -hmm. What was at stake for Dennis, Derek Carr for us was if he had a bad year this year, it might be the last year that people view him mm -hmm. as a starting Absolutely. quarterback in the NFL, like your answer for a team, not mm -hmm. just a guy who you bring in to mentor a young guy or so-and-so got hurt. Well, it's a good thing we have Derek Carr. Derek Carr, right now in New Orleans, he's the only answer you got. Mm -hmm. And the narrative that you hope Clint Kubiak can help Derek Carr achieve is he's a guy like Kirk Cousins who you bring into a team and, hey, you surround him with the right pieces, Derek Carr can help you win. Because we both said in the offseason we had a podcast about uh, – ranking the quarterbacks, where does Derek Carr land? And we both felt like he kind of fell in that mm -hmm. 14 to 18. Yep. I'm sure you got a lot of people who would probably argue he's 20 or below. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have some people who would argue he's above 14. But, you know, in this Clint Kubiak offense, what, it, what we saw Sunday, Carolina or not, he played like a top 10 quarterback. He did. Am I saying he is a top 10 quarterback? No, I'm not. But he's got a lot of opportunities to prove himself right Coming up, because you've got that Dallas defense with Micah Parsons and Trayvon Diggs. You've got the Philly defense, the Tampa defense, which looked good against, uh, obviously, Jaden Daniels mm -hmm. as a rookie. But that Tampa defense looked good against Jaden Daniels at times. You've got the Kansas City defense, uh -huh. Atlanta's defense. Mm -hmm. You've got some defenses coming up in the next five weeks. And if Derek Carr and that offense looks how it did against Carolina on Sunday, not only will you have a pretty good record in what's – Definitely a tough stretch to start the season. I think a lot of people will start looking at Carr a lot different. Well, yeah, and I, I think that's it. And it's back to the original question, the theme of this podcast. Can he change the narrative? Can Kubiak help him change the narrative? I mean, you can't argue with the results. And there was a little bit of all of us just kind of like, okay, what's this going to look like? You know, and I'm look, and again, we're, we're going to preface this by saying it's one week and there's no film on Kubiak with the Saints. I mean, there's film on Kubiak being an offensive coordinator, but there's no film on Kubiak with the Saints, although it certainly felt like the Saints defense didn't have much film on, on a Canales offense with, yeah. with Bryce Young, and yet they looked pretty prepared. So 
Um, I just think from an overall, you know, because it, it, I, I, I talked to him a, a couple of times in training camp, and I, I, when you talked to him last year, he was excited this time of year. And they won the season opener last year. It was a kind yeah. of a grinded out game. Honestly, that was kind of the game I was kind of expecting, kind of a grinded out type, you know, 20, 21 to 17 type game. Um, he was excited and, but he didn't have really two feet down in new Orleans at that point. And then there was a lot of movement and the family and everything. And I've, I've said this before, but where he's at mentally, both family, city, um, football, some teammates they didn't necessarily get along with or no longer here. Mm-hmm. Feels like the team, they voted him as a team captain, kind of embraced him as a leader I just feels like he is in a much more comfortable place, a much more secure place. And then he's got this offense where clearly something clicked, at least in week one, um, to at least uh, put him in a position to, uh, like you said, I mean, if he was the NFC Offensive Player of the Week, would that be a shock? No, not at all. He played it would be. Like I mean, he played. I mean, he was fantastic. But to make that statement so early it's like it disarmed all the haters. It just it completely disarmed anyone that was looking for a reason to say, it. yeah, you know, they won, but it was just kind of whatever. The very first or very first drive, fifth play of the game, he's not just throwing it deep. He's going deep to Shahid as he's getting hit because that was always a narrative on him as well. He's kind of he kind of freaks a little bit under pressure. Hung in there, took a couple hits, and then delivered a dime. I think it was. I think it was fantastic, and I think it set the tone for his entire day. But the bottom line is this: it is step one. But you keep winning. You won't win back more who that nations because they're not haters. They're not just gonna like yeah. just hate you for no reason. They're gonna you know they will come back around if especially if you've proven uh, that you can do uh, you know, the the job at hand. And I think Saints fans are smart enough to understand he's never gonna be Drew. He's never gonna be Drew. Nobody might ever. But be if, Drew but again. if he can be solid Derek Carr with this offense, that might just be enough to get you back to the postseason. That's true. And you know, looking at that offense and. A lot of things kind of surprised me, kind of outside of the offensive line, which you might call the weakest unit Mm -hmm. on the team, you could argue, is the tight ends. And the tight ends were very involved yesterday. Foster Moreau had a couple catches. Mm -hmm. He caught a touchdown. Uh, Derek Carr had a beautiful pass to Jawan Johnson in the corner of the Mm -hmm. end zone. Jawan Johnson got a touchdown. If you're guessing who was going to get the touchdowns, you probably wouldn't guess that two or three of Carr's touchdowns would go to tight ends. And just looking at the Kubiak offense, man, it felt so much more fast-paced. There's all the motion that you thought you were going to see, you got it. The creativity, you got it. There was so much motion, so many times. There, I believe one time AK was out wide mm-hmm. where Rasheed Shahid and Taysom Hill were in the backfield. Like Just watching this offense, now that they finally took the training wheels off that they were using in the preseason, what kind of stuck out to you from that on Sunday? Oh, a whole lot. A whole lot. I mean, because a first and foremost, because I just rewatched it. Um, the amount of toss plays, toss yeah. sweep left, toss sweep right, toss zone left, toss zone right, toss crack. They probably ran that more. At least it felt like probably more in one game yesterday than they they had in the last 10, 12, 15 years. I mean, that is the bread and butter play: the outside zone, the toss zone. Get to the edge is, is basically what it is. They probably ran more of that than any uh, any other time that I can recall in a game. Because, um, you know, you, you'd see it under the former offense, you know, you'd see a toss here, a toss there. But they, sometimes they'd go a whole game without even without running a toss. They had a, I mean, they had a bunch. And they ran it very effective. Um, so that's one. Two, you can see just how comfortable this offensive line is playing on the move which is all the toss zone is, the wide zone is. They're, you're moving. I mean, you're not staying static. You are moving, getting to the second level, uh, kind of crossing the face of the, uh, of the defender in front of you and getting to that next level, pulling, all that stuff. I mean, you are seeing just how comfortable this offense is on the move. And the offense was the biggest concern. It not at any point did it feel like a vulnerability yesterday no. at all. They scored that includes, on all nine of that's a, Exactly. That includes Trevor Penning who looked really good moving like that. Now, he had the one holding call, which was a little unnecessary by him, but I thought he looked... I mean, I I didn't see a whole lot of bad play. I know there was a couple of moments in pass protection where he got some help, but I mean, I didn't think he gave up a sack. Um, And then Fuaga, I thought was awesome. I mean, I thought he was fantastic. He got the one holding call that brought back Kamara's touchdown. I didn't see it initially, but Deuce told me that he kind of pulled at him, 
So I'll, I'll trust Deuce on that one. But nonetheless, I thought both tackles were really good. Um, and I just felt like the offensive line, you're seeing how this scheme can mask some deficiency there. Now, if you get behind 24 nothing and the play action and the run game goes away, then we'll see. But the bottom line is the, the, the whole objective is to not get behind by 24 yeah. points in a game because you saw what happened when Carolina had to do it. They were completely done. Uh, they were kind of done really at that Touchdown, interception, field goal. Really felt like Carolina had really checked out of that game. Game plan out the window. A couple of things here that also stood out. Um, I was surprised that when I read the stat that Taysom only played 21 snaps because it felt like he was everywhere. Yeah. 21 snaps is only like 20% of the snaps in the offense. But he was at fullback. He was at tailback. He was at H-back. He was at tight end. He was at quarterback. He only had six touches, but it just felt like he was... Maybe I just noticed him more because of all the positions that he plays, but it just felt like he had a big impact. And you look at the stat sheet, it was only six touches, but you just kind of feel his presence. You can tell Kubiak is going to use that versatility a lot. That really stood out to me. And you mentioned Foster Moreau. Best game as a Saint? Yeah, I mean, sure. had the touchdown, had that incredible catch on the sideline. He's in mm-hmm. concussion protocol. Hopefully he'll be okay. Uh, I think that was one where he caught it on the sideline, kind of got up a little wobbly. Yeah. I thought it was his best game as a Saint. And then I just think the overall flow, some play design, the Jawan touchdown, it's Kamara as the receiver, it's Shahid in the backfield as the running back. It's You can tell Carolina was all up in confusion when it came to what actually they were running on that play. So, look, one game, and he was hold, you could tell he was holding a lot of that in over the preseason, mm-hmm. Kubiak. And eventually the tape will catch up. And eventually they will have to adjust and self-scout and figure some things out. Because that, that wasn't their whole playbook. Trust me on that. Oh, that wasn't yeah. their whole playbook. Trust me on that. But, and there's going to be some new wrinkles next week and the week after and the week after. And then eventually the tape catches up. This is what that happens in the NFL. That's what makes it so challenging. But in the meantime, score some points. Yeah. They keep those defenses guessing because I don't know if they're going to score 47 every week, but keep doing it until somebody stops you. That's all I got to say. Yeah, and you mentioned the offensive line. Trevor Penning, to me, was very impressive because he's the guy who most people have pointed to as the weak link of Mm -hmm. the offense as a whole, not just the offensive line. And Trevor Penning had a good game. Now, we'll see. Mm -hmm. You might have to slide some help his way in Dallas because that'll be Micah Parsons coming off the edge. That's a little different than Jadavian Clowney. But he looked good. Taliese Fuaga, who, by the way, is still a rookie Playing his in his first and preseason, we have not talked about game. that nearly enough. Yeah. That man, rookie left a tackle, a rookie protecting the blind yeah. side of your franchise yeah. quarterback, and outside of that one holding call, you probably can't mention anything that Fuaga did badly. The interior of the offensive mm-hmm. line played well. Carr was only sacked one time, and it was early in that <laughs> game. Mm-hmm. They scored on every possession. I was just impressed. The tight ends, the offensive line, the two units who you'd probably be most worried about, they played exceptionally. And you mentioned, you know, how much they may have left in the chamber in this offense. We barely used Chris Olave mm-hmm. and Taysom Hill. Mm-hmm. Chris Olave only had, what, two, three catches on the game? Two. Taysom Hill, Two catches on the game for Olave. Taysom Hill had six touches on offense. Mm-hmm. That's two of your three top playmakers. Mm-hmm. And they barely touched the ball, and that's how the offense looked. So, yeah, believe me, as these weeks go on and on, I think you'll see – more Olave, and I believe that's something that Dennis Allen mentioned after the game was kind of getting Olave more involved in the game. That'll plan. happen. That, yeah, yeah. Now I'm not worried about that at all. And Taysom, you know, there's about 73 ways you can yeah. use Taysom. So, yeah, this, I think Kubiak is just getting started, and over the next month you'll see a lot better defenses than you saw on yeah. Sunday. So if you can do some of those same things, the second half of your schedule is when things really get easy yeah. for the Saints. So if you can hold on in this first month and a half – Things will look really yeah. up as we go uh, through this season. I agree. And, look, I, I'll say this as well. There was a lot more. They used the fullback a lot more. Traditional fullback and Prentice. They used a lot of multiple tight end sets a lot more. Because usually, over the last few years, the majority has been in that three wide receiver, one tight end, 11 personnel set. But this, they had 12 personnel, 22 personnel. And it's you see the problem Taysom presents when he shows up and he's at a fullback, but you don't necessarily account for him in, that, in the personnel group that you're trying to match with defensively. You see him at the tailback, and then well, what, 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 are, what personnel they're in now if you're a defender. So you could just tell Kubiak that that is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger what he does uh, with Taysom Hill. So I just think all in all, got to go A-plus, man. I got to go yeah. A-plus. I don't, I don't see how you can score higher than your debut as an offensive coordinator – and you go nine for nine with your starters and scoring points. I mean, not since I remember 
Greg Williams' debut back in 09, I think it was Detroit, they had like four or five picks in that game. And I remember his first day as a tra- at training camp, how intense the guy was. But not since him has a coordinator made such an impact this early in his first game as a coordinator. That's true. And somebody else who made an impact on Sunday who a lot of times this guys like this go under the radar until you're ready or mm-hmm. until you need to talk about them. But he contributed to them scoring points as well. And that's Blake Groupie. Yeah. Great. Blake Groupie hit a really long field goal to start this game off. I believe it was 57 yards mm-hmm. was his first field goal. He was four for four on the day. Blake Groupie, who caught a little criticism last year. Blake Groupie, who was in a kicker competition throughout the preseason and throughout training camp with uh, it was Charlie Smith. Charlie Smith, yeah. And Blake Groupie, who wound up winning that job because he really locked in over the last month or so. He looked really good as we kind of wrap this podcast up. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, Hayball didn't have to punt till the fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah. um, but I thought the special things were outstanding. You talk about Groupie has had a different look in his eye ever since Charlie Smith made that 65 yarder mm-hmm. at Tulane. I'm telling you, he has had a different look in his eye. And look, he's rewarding the coach's faith in him because honestly, you know, there were times last year on this podcast, I was like, I don't understand why they're so loyal to him, to this kid, because it's not like he's been there a long time. I mean, you can find a kicker that gives you, I think he had missed like seven field goals. You could probably find you a kicker that gives you a little bit better accuracy or at least the same. There's no, maybe he has the kind of the hot leg now. You don't have to necessarily have to worry about a guy dealing with some confidence issues, but they stuck with him. They stuck with him. It's a 57, it's a 52. Um, hit, uh, was it two other field goals? Was it four field goals? Yeah, four, four field goals. And then, look, Shahid had the big punt return. Jawan Johnson had a, had a blocked punt. Taysom almost blocked another punt as well. So yeah. you're talking about really, really good special teams, uh, a defense that that dominated, and then an off. But the offense, obviously, was the story and was the show because those two guys, Kubiak and Derek Carr, are intertwined because the, 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 those two need to be on the same page. And, boy, did they look like they were on the same page on Sunday? They definitely were, and I'm excited to hear what Derek Carr, because we talked to Derek Carr on Wednesday, and yeah. that's when we'll have our next podcast. So I'm excited to see what he thought about the game and how he's where his mind's at kind of heading into Dallas. Yeah, we'll see. It's a big one, no doubt about it. Um, put this one behind you if you're the Saints, if you're the fan base. Keep enjoying it. You can enjoy it as long as you want until Sunday rolls around. Yep. Um, in the meantime, stay safe out there with Tropical Storm. Is it? Francine, is Francine, it, the name? Is it, gonna, yeah, it could bump like up to a to a Hurricane 2 was the latest advisor we had, depending on what time you watch this podcast, that could have been updated even more. But nonetheless, uh, stay safe out there. We should be back on Wednesday, provided we're not doing some kind of hurricane coverage, but you never know. But until then, for Andre Johnson Jr., I am Sean Fazan. We'll catch you guys next time on Overtime.